everybody. Welcome to the October 2020 meeting of Triangle Association of Freelancers. My name is Dom Vaughn, and this evening our guest speaker is graphic novelist Wayne Van Zandt. Wayne lives in Georgia. He got his start working for Marvel Comics on a comic book called The Nam, and after that went on to create, write, research, and illustrate a wide variety of nonfiction, very factually accurate, military-themed graphic novels. Now, Wayne does a different kind of writing than most of us do in this organization, and that's why I invited him to join us tonight. I think it's important for us to reach out and hear about how other people do their specific kinds of writing. Wayne is an artist writer, and he comes to this with a very unique perspective. So please welcome Wayne Van Zandt. Wayne, it's great to see you. Hey, um, uh, first of all, um, I neglected to mention, though, that you recently received the silver medal for the Military Writers Society of right. America. I wanted to congratulate you on Thank that. You. And and tell us a little bit about what that involved. Was that for a specific project or that, an it was individual? for uh, Katusha. It was for, for Katusha. Katusha. Yeah. Um, I, I was, you know, of course, in the middle of uh, pushing um, uh, Katusha. Katusha came out about a year and a half ago. And it's a project I've worked on for about a dozen years. You know, I, I always work on something. If I don't, if I don't have an assigned project, I work on something. I'll come up with something I can eventually uh, sell. And I came up with an idea about that, and you showed it. But I've got one that's got the, the sticker on it here. <laughs> so yeah, and and uh, um, I worked on that between projects for many years. Did a lot of research and reading. Went to Eastern Europe twice to do research on it, and you know. It, it, you can't go research everything you want to do at, you know, uh, like you're going to do a book about Alaska. You can't always just get up and go to Alaska to research it. And, but I was, uh, I made two trips over there. Um, I would like to do some more traveling with some things I would like to do. I really, I don't know my old editor, Larry Hyma says, well, you're not going to go to some of these little islands in the Pacific or something like that. I says, no, I'll just read about them, you know, but, but, uh, or get eaten by cattle. Well, I, mean, I want to talk to you about your research process a little bit more in depth than just a minute. But as I noted in the introduction, you kind of got your start as an artist at Marvel Comics. Yes. Um, and are known primarily for your work on the NAM which yeah. is an ongoing series set at the Vietnam War. Tell us a little bit about how you became associated with Marvel, how that- well, it, is, it was funny. I, I, I was working at the High Museum in Atlanta. I was assistant um, director of security. And later on, I was the director for security. I, I can't remember the started exactly how it happened, but um, I'd seen a, uh, uh, the black and white magazine Savage Tales that Marvel had done. I saw it on a convenience store, you know, stand, the black and white, you know, larger size. And, and they had, you know, war movie, war stories and uh, uh, Westerns and adventure stories in there. And I thought, well, I can do this. So I just did a bunch of artwork and some story ideas and, uh, I, and I sent it in, into them and I just forgot about it. Now, about two weeks later, I got a, a letter from Larry Hammer and all it said was scrawled on a piece of their letterhead can use you do you have a daytime phone that, that was it you know and um i got to talk to him and i wrote and illustrated about three stories for them and then it went bust but the very first time i talked to him he said we have a new comic coming out called the nom about vietnam and uh he says we've got a real good artist who was michael golden who was, was great but he says he's a little slow and um we would like you to do some fill-in issues so i did one uh, and it was number seven i remember uh and then by issue 14 i was on the book full time and it was just like a um it was just a crash of things happening it seemed like and so for about next several years i uh, uh, illustrated the nom i got seven months ahead on that book and i remember i i i had to i wanted to do so many things i said i got all these ideas and Marvel was never much at realistic war stories. I mean, you know, that was, the nom was about it. And um, I kept punching ideas to the editor in chief and my editor, uh, which was, um, oh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now, but he said, listen, there's a lot of small publishers out there. Why don't you go do something for them, you know? 
So I started, I did a series called Days of Darkness for uh, Apple Comics. Yeah, they've been, they ran it, went out of business back in the mid 90s, I believe. I did a series about uh, the early war in the Pacific. In fact, it began with the uh, attack on Pearl Harbor. And the first issue was a, what came out in December of, uh, there you go. Well, you know, first issue came out uh, in December of uh, 91, the 50th anniversary. And um, I did a couple of others for some other publishers. And, um, but then the, then the um, uh, downturn came about with comics in the early mid nineties and uh, the non was canceled and uh, those publishers went bust and I was looking for a job. And, but I, I wanted to somehow keep, keep involved with it. So, but uh, this guy approached me, Ethan Crash, he's remained a real good friend of mine. He wanted to start a company that did uh, safety training for industry. And he basically wanted to do little comic books of safety issues. And uh, he needed to have, he needed me to come to work for him full time. But he says, I won't have enough work for you to do be busy five days a week. He says, was it, is there something else you would like to do? And we decided to print some comic books to, to sell to the market. And um, I did a, a Civil War series called um, um, The Heritage Collection. That, you know, back uh, Ken Burns' uh, documentary had come out not long before that. And it was, of course, hot, hot, Civil War is always a hot subject. But I did that. And then later on, um, I got into graphic novels. I still do a little work for Ethan now and then. But um, it, it was fun working for Marvel. But I, I always was more proud of the stuff I did that I wrote myself. And uh, that brings me to my next question, though, Wayne. You're, you're, most people know you as an artist, but you're unique among your peers in that you write the graphic novels you illustrate. Do you consider yourself a writer who draws or an artist who writes? <laughs> I'm not sure it makes a difference, but I, I think I'm more of a writer that draws. I would have to say I'm a writer that draws because what I'm doing is telling a story. Um, when I was a kid, um, my father worked for uh, Southern Railway, the offices in Atlanta, and he'd bring these little pads, these little white pads that were kind of gummed on the side and I would sit in church and draw comics and when I when I was when I was five we saw in 1954 we saw um, the Disney uh, 20,000 20, Leagues Under the Sea and it exploded my imagination I was drawing giant squids and, and submarines and all that and also on TV they had the old reruns of um, Saturday morning of uh, Flash Gordon that my dad had seen when he was a kid. And you, you know, you, you can find those on YouTube. Man, they're terrible. <laughs> but they were so good. I mean, but you know, all that stuff, in, you know, interests me. And then later on in the 50s, I got a little older, I started reading comics and got really got into war comics. And also, I, um, I grew up, you know, my parents were in the World War II generation. My dad was in the Navy. And consequently, all my friends were about the same age. Their parents were about the same age. So I grew up knowing a lot of people that served in the military during the war. And even my, my mother worked for Southern Railway. That's where she met my dad, but she worked there during the war. And she remembers, like one time, uh, being on a train, but going, her and some girlfriends were going to go to the beach down on Jacksonville. And there was a train in the station right next to him, just inches away, you know. And it was full of German soldiers coming from the surrender of the Africa Corps in Tunisia. They're all heading out west. And uh, she remembers that. And little things, she, she saw President Roosevelt's body being brought back from Warm, Warm Springs and stuff like that. So my, it, my, even my mother was like, I remember my mother first told me about the Holocaust. And I remember just different things that people would tell me. And I guess I had the ability to put it all together. And uh, I remember I had a, a Sunday school teacher one time. Well, I had one Sunday school teacher, Otis Bentley. He's them dirty Germans 
but he he was in the third division in World War II. That was Audie Murphy's outfit. He didn't know Audie, but he had heard of him when he was in. But he was with them from North Africa, Sicily, Italy, France, Germany, you know. So I had, and a lot of them wouldn't, wouldn't tell many stories, but it, it, whatever they did tell, I was ready to get in there and listen, you know. <laughs> so I, I, all that history, history has been a, just a, a tremendously important thing in my life. Let me ask you, Wayne, um, because you're, you're talking to a group of writers, we're all very curious about your, your creative process. Um, let's start a little bit with how you select a topic for a graphic novel, whether it's the Battle of the Bulge or Grant versus Lee. What elements must a story contain for it to really grab your interest and make you want to tell it? Well, you, you know, I did that, that series, that Civil War series uh, for, for, for uh, Ethan, and uh, I did one on... Uh, Shallow. I did one on. Uh, I've done several books on Gettysburg. Did one on the Battle of Atlanta. But I remember doing one. It was called Stonewall in the Shenandoah about the Stonewall Jackson's campaign in the Shenandoah. And what I loved about doing that, there were it was it was people. There were so many interesting characters. Jackson himself, but he had all these. Uh, he, he had enough officer in his command he was from connecticut but he had come down to, the, to virginia to teach school and when the success uh, the south succeeded this guy joined the confederate army you know he loved it down here and he he was an explorer too and he had been up and down the shenandoah and he would draw maps for uh for jackson he would he would go ahead before a battle and try to scout around and see what things are like. And he had a, a, a I don't know if it still exists or not, but he, he drew, drew a map of the valley that was like 12 feet long that, that they kept rolled up and carried in a wagon, you know. But you know, it, it, to me, that was important as it was about people. And, you know, um, that's why I can't get real excited about a, a lot of generalship, you know, stuff like that. I mean, it's interesting. All of it is. But you got to have, there's going to be people there in that story, you know. And that's what I, I enjoyed about Katusha so much, you know. Well, um, let's talk about your research, though. You, these, the, bo the books you create are almost like illustrated textbooks in a way, um, in that they're factually accurate about a specific person or battle or campaign. Tell us a little bit about how you research these stories. You had mentioned earlier that you had made two trips to Ukraine for Katusha, for right. example. Let, let's start there. Why were those trips important? To, well, I had, been, to I had been there before, um, a couple of years earlier, in the late 90s. I went with a family I knew in Marietta nearby who, um, this lady was from Ukraine and she was bringing her mother over. And several of them were going over. I said, that'd be not a great trip. They said, why don't you go with us? So I was with them, but uh, her um, her uh, mother lived in Odessa. That was really the first city I got to go to. And, and I, lo I loved Ukraine. Yeah, this is gonna sound strange. Odessa, people that have been to Odessa and Savannah, Georgia, see how much they're alike. Savannah, Georgia, there's something about it that's like Odessa and vice versa. It's a port city, it's built on the bluff, it's very festive and they just, and everybody I talked to, they've been both. They go, well, yeah, I agree with you. But anyway, I, I was at a party. I was at a party over there. This was at 98 or 99. And uh, uh, they, they love to sing. They're very musical. They're very, you know, the, 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 by the way, the song, uh, You Are My Sunshine. You Know Are My Sunshine. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, the, it's the state song of Louisiana. It is a Ukrainian song, originally. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard people over there sing it. And, and Ukrainian, it's really a trip, you know. But anyway, I, I was at this apartment and there was about, I guess there were probably about maybe 15, 18 people there. I was the only male. I was the only male there at the party, I remember. But uh, the um, there were several old ladies and they were singing, sitting there singing and some of them had great voices. But all of a sudden they started singing this song and they were, man, they were shaking the roof, you know. And I thought, I've heard that tune. What is that? Where have I heard that tune? And I heard that tune on the old British series about World War II. Um, uh, World at War? World at War, yes. And the episode about 
the Russian front. Mm -hmm. It was Katusha. I asked this lady, I said, what's that? She said, that's Katusha. And, uh, and it's, it was a love song written by a Ukrainian in the uh, 1930s, and it became the most popular song in the Red Army. If you see scenes from like Victory Day on Red Square any year, they will have a T-34 rolling down the, the road, and uh, the band would be playing Katusha. So that's just stuck in my brain. I just, I couldn't get it out of my mind. And uh, I finally said, this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have a girl that's named Katusha. Katusha is really, uh, the, the, the proper name is a Katarina, which is the same as Catherine. So Katusha is like Kathy, a little Catherine. And, um, uh, you know, I didn't, I don't have any mention of the song in the story, but everybody that, everybody from over there that's know about what it is. And, you can, and can sing it. I, I was there in 2005 in uh, um, in Kiev, and I was walking along with my translator. I'd, hey, things are so cheap over there. You can hi, hire a, a, a guide and a, a, a translator for a week, you know. And we're walking on the street, and then about seven high school girls came running down, and they heard us talking. And they says, are you from America? In English. And I said, yes. They said, we're in an English uh, language school in a, a class in our high school. And um, they said, what are you doing here? You know? And uh, mostly Americans go there and just chase women. But anyway, it, it's uh, uh, the, and they, I, I said, well, I'm writing a book about, uh, you know, uh, World War II. And uh, that's what it's called. And uh, I said, Katusha. And they laughed and they stood there on the sidewalk and sang all three verses. All of them did, you know? So, I mean, inspiration like that, you can't turn it down. How else did you research this story, though, Wayne, as far as the individual, the technology, and the actual oh, the story uh, of, of... I of grabbed a couple of my Berlin. books to give you an example. Um, this book here, Night of Stone, Death and Memory in 20th Century Russia by Catherine Meridale. That is one of the best books I've ever read about Russia. She is a British... Uh, historian and spent a lot of time over there, speaks the language, and she did a lot of her research in the, in the 80s and 90s when they were digging up all the mass graves of Stalin's victims. And uh, it is extremely moving. It really it covers the whole 20th century. But um, uh, she also wrote a book called Ivan's War, Ivan's War, that's put it about the Red Army in World War II, which is real good. But this one is my favorite. It's just a very emotional book, but um, I, 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 things like that. And also, this I didn't read. No, this I was nearly finished with it. This lady won the Nobel Prize. Um, oh, here it is. Here you go. She. It, it, this is about the women in World War Two, and I, I, I was almost finished with the Katusha. I found out. I was, oh my God! I'm going to read stuff in there that I got it all wrong. But I read it and I found out I, I didn't have anything wrong. <laughs> but. Uh, but I, as I say, I read about the country and, and the people and the, um, there's, there's little things you kind of get to know and, and, and the, their reactions about things. And I remember saying something to a girl in uh, um, Odessa one time and she said, eh, maybe. I just remember the way she said that. It was a non a, a disagreement, but non-confrontational. And I remember in the movie, did you ever see the movie called um, Eastern? Um, oh gosh! I'll buy it on. No, no, it's it's a it's a it's a not too old. Um, uh, what was that guy's name? Vigo Morgan. Vigo Mortensen. Yeah, yeah, he, he was in it, and he plays this uh, uh, Russian guy who's in the Russian mob in London. And there's a scene where somebody asks him a question. And he kind of goes like that, you know. And I thought that is that was perfect. That's like you get the reaction you would get, you know, from people, and, and just their mannerisms and, and stuff like that. But um, um, I, 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 as I say, I, I've talked to many people over there. But also, you know, you, you, you got the I just had to read the history of the war, and I read a lot about that. I met a guy over there who had been a high school teacher and he spoke pretty good English. He was an old guy, he was retired. And uh, and I was telling him about what I wanted to do. And he says, well, he says, if you're gonna understand the war, 
in, 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 in Russia, you got to understand the revolution. And if you want to understand the revolution, you need to go back to 1891, where they had the big famine. And that was when they saw that the, the Russian government of the Tsar was incapable of handling anything. And that was the start of the revolution right there. And I found a, a, a great book by a guy named, um, it's called uh, A People's Tragedy. Um, oh gosh, Let's see if I see it over there. <laughs> Not Max Hastings. Oh no, I love Max Hastings though. No, it, it was a guy. It was, it was about the revolution, about the Russian Revolution. Um, uh, Orlando Figs, F I G E S, is his last name. Uh, that was him, yeah. And it's funny. It's it's a very controversial book because a lot of people have almost made an industry researching it to uh, prove him wrong, because. Um, Oh, is that somebody coming on? Yep, we're good. Okay, there you go. Okay, but um, but uh, he um, um, it's a real good one volume history of the revolution. So you get your re your work from a, a, a wide variety. Oh of, God, of, yeah, of place okay. of interviews of historical documents. Well, not just as I say. The thing is, I'm not just doing a. a, a it's not just doing a. Uh, uh, a text history or a text story also have to draw it and um, this is a book that was a big help I found the Soviet soldier and it's it's got everything in there from the beginning of the war till the end you know and it, things like that are very valuable clothing, sure. weapons, all of that Man. well and this is funny when I did the NOM, I bought me a full-scale model of an um, M16, an AK-47, and I also had a CAR-15. I get a real one now. But one thing I use a lot now, these are the action figure things. They're very accurate, particularly the ones done by Dragon. And this is a little uh, uh, Pabishaw 41, the you know uh, Soviet... Uh, uh, burp gun, you know, and uh, oh, I've got I've got tons of them. There's the M1, you know. Uh, I've got a. Uh, so these toys there. make great references. Oh, they do, they do. Well, I, they... Ask, I, I, this segues well to my next question, though, Wayne, because I was I really wanted to talk to you. Do you fully script a book before you sit down and start drawing? How how do you meld words with image? Well, um. I have, but mostly I do a little bit of everything as I go on. Now, when I, I, I when I went to my first trip to do research in 2005 to Ukraine, I came home and wrote and roughed out. Let me let's see. I had them somewhere here. I got so much stuff piled up; it's ridiculous. But um, oh, here we go. Here's one. Now you can't really see much on this. It's just uh, it's. I, 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 you know, I, every, up just a little bit higher. There you go. That it. Okay. Now I go into um, InDesign and I have like a, the size page that I know it's going to be, and I type out the the, uh, the dialogue, and I don't too worry too much about spelling or anything during that, you know, part of the process. But then I can sit down and sketch what's going on in each one of these. I started doing that when I worked for Marvel. Uh, editors loved it. I would, but then again, I would just, I'd mail it to them then. I would sit down and sketch out the script of the NOM, how I was going to do it. And editors loved it. They were crazy about it. But anyway, I, I do it like that. And I draw, uh, let's see, here we go. Now, I don't draw whole comic pages very much. I usually do in, in, in parts. And say, for instance, this right here is a, what I'm working on now, page 10C, which means that at the, at the bottom of the, uh, it's at the bottom of the uh, page. The A, B, and C, if, it, if it's, you know, like, like three steps like that. And uh, 
I don't ink anymore. I haven't inked in years. All of Katusha is just pencil. I did it in pencil. And I also, the uh, regular comment page is 11 by 17. And uh, you ask me, you have about 10 inches of uh, space, drawing space. <coughs> I'll go all the way at the end. And since I pencil it, it gives me a little bit more, you have to reduce it a little bit more and it helps tighten it up a little bit too. Mm -hmm. I do that. I, I, I scan it into uh, Photoshop. I color it in Photoshop, but then I print it out on, um, let me find your one here. I print it out on uh, cardstock. Let's see what we got here. And, uh, Add more color to it with markers. Give you a little idea. Like this, this is the top of the page. This is the second tier, so the pickles don't have any of the dialogue or anything. Mm -hmm. it. And I scan it and I put it on the page. And uh, so, give you an example. You can see here. This is uh, some of this is not colored yet. This this page side over here, and this is. So I go ahead and do the pencil, do the, the line work, so to speak, scan it into the computer, put it on InDesign. And, um, but you, do you have, do you write the script first? Do you write the, the words first, the entire story? And then always. once you have it, then boom, boom, boom? No, not always. I, uh, I haven't done this with the publisher yet because I don't think they're going to like it. But most people, if you're doing something for them, like they did the books for uh, the Bulge book or the Normandy book, mm -hmm. uh, I had the whole story written before then. But that's a historical thing. It's just like you can write it. That's no problem. But I find, um, I, I just I just finished, well, a couple months ago, I finished a graphic novel. Hey, it's been dead for everybody this year, no doubt. So I haven't had anything to work on, but I'll work on something no matter what. But I had a graphic novel idea I had a long time ago and I had a character called Patron. I wanted to bring him back. I haven't, it was like in the early 90s. I did a mini series about him. He's a French foreign legion in World War II. But uh, all kinds of different you know things he gets into. But um, I wanted to do a graphic novel uh, about him, and I did one. It's about 202 pages. And I found with that, I like to draw it, uh, write it, a little bit of it, draw it, stop and color it and all that, and even get the whole, whole chapter done. And uh, before I moved on to something else, it, I found that you had ideas of what to, I knew where it was going to end. I heard they say that was the guy that did the Lonesome Dove. Uh, um, Larry McMurty. Larry McMurty. Somebody asked him well, how he wrote a book. He said, well, I start off with the end. He says, I come up with a good ending and I go from there. And that, that kind of makes sense. It really does. But with this, um, I knew how it was going to end. But getting there, I could, by doing a little bit at a time, something would come up in the drawing. They'll go, wait a minute. I'm going to do that to that character. You know, so sometimes it goes in a little different direction than you initially yeah. anticipated. And, and, and I like that. It's, it's exciting. And it's uh, it's a lot more entertaining for me. I know that. I enjoy it a lot, a lot more. Let's talk a little bit about your adaptation of uh, Eric Maria Remarque's anti-war novel, All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, you did that for um, uh, Dead Reckoning, I believe, yeah. correct? Yeah. It, this was this the second adaptation you have done. The first one being uh, Red Badge of Courage. I did well. Actually, I did Red Badge of Courage twice. I did it once for a comic company called First Comics mm -hmm. that went out of business, but I got paid for my work. And I really, I don't think I even had any of that work left. But I did that again. It was a small size, you know, the the, the new one. That one. And uh, so I've done that twice. But. Uh, all Quiet was something I've always wanted to do. Well, I wanted to ask you, one, what drew you to that work? And second, in adapting an already existing novel, how did you decide what to keep in and what to discard? Well, the, that, that makes a difference with that particular book because it's not that big of a book. Now, Red Badge of Courage is a smaller book mm -hmm. and you can put 
just about, in fact, with all Quiet on the Western Front, I had just about every incident in that book, in the graphic novel. Um, I don't, I can't think of anything I left out. I mean, you, you, you know, you lose a little of the dialogue maybe and all that, but uh, still, you've got all the story in there, you know, so I didn't, and that was one good thing. But if I was going to do a graphic novel of, um, oh, For Whom the Bell Tolls or something like that, that's just, uh, I don't know, some things are good for adaptions and some are not. And uh, it, to me, All Quiet would have always been a good one. What made that story so successful for you, something that really drew you, that you wanted to illustrate it? Well, um, I had read it a number of times over the years, and it's just a beautiful story. And, um, you know, he wrote a lot of other novels after that, mm -hmm. but hardly everybody's ever heard of them. But they say they were all good. I like to kind of track down some of them sometimes. They said all of his writings were good. Um, and uh, it, it was a very uh, emotional uh, I just remember particular incidents. I, one, it's funny. One thing, you know, the little things you remember. I remember reading. You remember the, the character Cat mm -hmm. is the older guy. You know who was the. I remember towards the end when he gets injured. You remember he gets mm -hmm. a, a, a shin or something like that. And Paul, the main character, says to himself, "You know, when he's gone, I'll have no friends left." You know, and I just thought that was just extremely touching comment you know and, and there, there are several parts in that book and it's not just the action or something like that but there's uh the the personality of the characters i thought came through real well um so that that's it's a great work and your adaptation is terrific right. really yeah. enjoyed it i used to do one, one more thing i used to go to world war one reenactments uh I, in fact a friend of mine that lives in spartanburg uh, got me into back, this is back in 89 i think when i was working for marvel he says he was a reenactor all kinds of different reenactments and he said the most fun is the one the world one events i said well i like to go and take some pictures so he said well if you want to go take pictures we need to get you in uniform and so i got the old set up and i went for about 10 years hmm. so i had a pretty good feel of uh you know uh what it was like in the trenches so, you know, I never got shot out of gas or anything. And that brings things even more vividly to your own work. Yeah, yeah. It, Wayne, it, who is your audience? When you sit down to write and draw a graphic novel, who are you doing this for in your mind? Well, I know you're supposed to have somebody in mind, but I don't really. I, I just, um, I, I, I could tell you, I did it for myself, basically. I, it was like exploration. You know, um, I, I don't. I don't even know how to answer that. Um, there, there are some things I would probably never tackle because I know there's no, there is no audience. You know, but um, I, I don't know. Well, I have a lot of friends that are interested in history and and, and things like that. So, and, and hey, there's a lot of people that would look at it and go, eh, not for me. You know, but. Uh, well, I love, as I mentioned before, I love history. And it's, it's a, it may be a strange statement, but I've always had difficulty understanding the times that I live in. <laughs> I don't I don't think I could have, um, when I, when I uh, did the nom for Marvel and did that artwork, it would have been more difficult if it was like 20 years earlier when I was right out of the Navy or something like that. Um, uh, you, you familiar with... Uh, Timothy Schneider. Yeah. Yeah. He, he said that he doesn't want to write anything that's not 40 years, at least 40 years in the past. So he knows he can get it right. <laughs> you know? And I kind of, I kind of that way too. And there's some, there's some things in history. I mean, Hey, that things in history that will start a fight. I mean, you know, uh, there, there are a lot of, you know, uh, I, I know I was, um, reading um, um, Anthony Beaver's book on the Spanish Civil War several years ago, and I remember thinking, this story would cause a fight in certain circles, you know, and I would, I'd like to do something about the Spanish Civil War, I really would, but uh, there some things are still hotly contested, and um, 
I don't know. I have you had to some... pick and choose. Yeah, and I had people. I remember a guy. I was starting on uh, Katusha, and I, went, I was at the um, Dragon Con, which I'm not real crazy about the Dragon Con. It's just too weird for me. But I was there and had some artwork for Katusha, and there was a guy came out. He saw that, and he got he got he says he said he had family from over there, and he got real angry. And I mean, his girlfriend was kind of standing back behind him, like, you know, like he's crazy, you know. And um, uh, it, it was gone. I thought it was going to come to a fight, you know. Um, Look, Wayne, let me ask you, uh, taking one step, half a step backwards, one of our members was wondering if you had, uh, regarding the rights to All Quiet on the Western Front, if you had any difficulties with that. Uh, well, we, we, it, we got it. And we had to, it was a pain in the neck. But there were times I wish we hadn't even started the project but because um uh, david my agent contacted them they said okay but once we got a publisher that's when the lawyers came in and um they had to um we had there was a certain amount the publisher was going to pay up front and we were going to have to half that and we still will half the uh um the royalties as they come in, which who knows, you know, who, who knows what comes in. Yeah. But uh, so that was kind of a pain. There. Now, one I would love to do is uh, Audie Murphy's To Hell and Back. Now, I don't know if you've ever read the book. You know, it was the old movie you see. The I'm not movie? familiar with that one. We, Audie Murphy, you remember him? Oh, you? yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he wrote a book after the war called Hell and Back, and it's, it's an incredible book. It was a, He had a ghostwriter working with him, this older guy. But it's, it's told in uh, first person, present, present tense. He says, like, I walk that way. I go, he says, that's all the time an infantryman has. So it's written that way. And it is an incredible book. And the movie was good, but it was a 1955 Hollywood war movie, you know, yeah. he played himself and all that. But I would love to do that. And then, again, it's not a real big book. I can very well easily get all of it in. So I would love to do Interesting. that. Interesting. Well, uh, speaking of writers, um, who were some, we mentioned Max Hastings as one, you mentioned Beavers as another. Are there any other writers you would recommend to your audience this evening? Who, who inspires you um, writing wise? Well, uh, I, there's several, of course, it's uh, tons of old stuff I've read and all, but to me, one of my favorite writers of recent times is um, uh, Alan First. You know, I'm familiar with him. Yeah. He writes the spy novels and all. He, I love his stuff. Um, I, my David thought of me about trying to get a rights and do one of his. But the thing is, his books are great, but there's very little action in them. I mean, it's all cerebral and recent. And you know, the and it's not. There's no very little action. But um, I, I like the idea of something like that. I've got some ideas of a, a book I'd like to do, kind of like that. Um, another one, good one was um, um, Philip Kerr, what his name? K E R R. Yeah, he wrote yeah. the uh, the um, Bernie Gunther detective. He's a right. Nazi, detective in Nazi Germany. Those were great. Those were very well researched. He's dead now. But, do you do uh, a lot of reading even today? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm always reading on something, and I got the. Books on my phone, I listen to them. <laughs> and, and uh, so I'm always looking for something. One thing I found recently, it was odd, that Patron character that I mentioned that mm -hmm. I want to do, um, he is an, um, he, he joins the foreign, he joins the foreign legion in France right after the Spanish Civil War. He comes over as a refugee. Patron is obviously a fictitious name. And I don't tell anything about him before then. And, uh, but um, I've got story ideas up into the way up into the 60s anyway for him for different wars. Indochina, he goes there and he winds up. But one, uh, I read uh, several ones. They're not in print anymore. Have you ever heard of Mad Mike Hoare? Mm -mm. H-O-A-R-E. He was a famous British, well, actually he was Irish. He was born in India, but he was a famous mercenary leader in, uh, mostly in the Congo in the 60s. And um, he wrote several books about his um, his uh, uh, actions and all that in different times. And uh, they're not available. 
but they got all of them on uh, Audible. A lot of it was I listened to him, and man, that guy could write. <laughs> well, I tell you, he was a fascinating character. I mean, he, um, and it, these stories, I want to do something about Patron in that era, too. So that, I started reading some of those. Or that listen. sounds awesome. Well, Wayne, this has been tremendous fun. Um, I've enjoyed it greatly, and I know everyone else has, too. I'd like to conclude by asking you what you would say to people who aren't particularly interested in comic books or graphic novels. Maybe they think they're just for young people. Why should people read your works and those of your contemporaries? What will they get from the experience? Oh. I, you know, that, that's a that's a hard question. I, I mean, because, man, I, you know, um, I know there's just a lot of people that are just not interested. Mm -hmm. They don't read anything. They don't care anything about history. They don't care anything about current events. They don't, as I remember an old guy saying one time, I don't care what's going on on the other side of that hill. <laughs> you know, I mean, mm -hmm. they're just people that way. Um I've always been fascinated with something that's that like that. You, you read about somebody in history and the things they went through and the, um, and all that. And, and to me, that's what that's what made us what we are, you know. So um, I don't know. And a lot of people that have uh, done uh, superheroes at comic conventions, I can almost tell if somebody's walking by my table whether or not they're going to stop and look, you know. Uh, and if the guy's going by dressed as, you know, Spock or something like that, he's probably not, although I like Star Trek too, you know, but you can tell he's not going to stop, you know, and, and you meet all kinds of different kinds. And I don't know, I can only, because I, I know I've talked to people about things and you can see their eyes kind of glass over and their, their mouth kind of go, you know, like they're, 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 they're bored with what you're saying. So I don't know. Um, have you have you had in, uh, positive encounters with veterans who come across your table at conventions? Oh see yeah. the books that you yeah. like and, and really oh, yeah. get into yeah. it. There's there's a little bookstore in Alpharetta, Georgia. That's on the other side of uh, uh, Marietta. I met those guys a couple of years ago, and I I've gone out there and signed books and stuff like that. And that they, they they are a big veterans uh, location. I mean, they have a lot of or two veterans that come in there, they're come rolling in just about. But, um, and, and a lot of those have been, you know, uh, very encouraging. Um, I'm it, really glad to hear that though. You are speaking to a lot of people with the books that you create. Uh, you know, I, I, that's important to me. You know, that that's important. And I see things and I, yes, I've been to some places that, um, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's kind of like, I mean, I've been to a lot of places and I'm thinking, here I am by myself, <laughs> you know, and, and this is so neat and it's so unique. And a lot of people would not get a, a bit of click out of it, you know, I mean, yeah. and uh, but it, we're all different, you know. Well, you know how much I enjoy your work, Wayne, and I do recommend his Wayne's novel, graphic novels to everybody. Um, this is, I think this is a good place for us to stop. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Wayne regarding his books or his creative process or anything about graphic novels at all or military history? All right, Wayne, I guess we did it. Uh, oh, uh, Liz? I'm sorry. Uh, Joel, you go first. Yeah, I had a, a question. Um, I do writing and illustration as well, but I found I'm going to um, using three dimensional programs like ZBrush, for instance. And I find it very useful that I can, it takes a long time, a longer time to create the original, but then once I've got it, I can shrink it, turn it around, turn it upside oh, down. Oh, yeah. Some of, you, some of these 3D programs and all. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, let me, hey, yeah, I put these out. And I'm glad I did. Now, when I did Katusha, you know, it is, of course, about a girl that's in uh, tanks, T-34s, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, so I drew probably the thousands of tanks doing that book. Well, I, I learned to cheat. Okay, here, here's one, that's a T-34. 
Mm -hmm. We're at 135th scale. Here's another one I did for another book. It's a British tank used in North Africa. But let me tell you what I do. I take. I, I'd like to. I'd like to know more about some of these three D programs. I tell. I'll tell you why in a minute. But what I would do, I would. I, I knew I was going to do a part of the story, and rather than sit there and like a draftsman, draw that tank from scratch, I would take a photograph of it. And mm -hmm. I, I know the scenes I was going to do. I had. A, I know it's going to be down like that, and it's got a turret turned or coming up like that or whatever. And I take a picture of it, just a little, you know, uh, uh, digital camera. I would, I would bring it and put it into um, um, Photoshop, Photoshop. Yeah. and on the paper, on the pa like on these black and white um, pages. Let me grab something here. But on one of these black and white pages, I do. I would actually have the panel on the on the screen, and I would. Um, put the model, uh, the picture of that tank on the um, mm -hmm. on the page, and um, I would take um, I would take a, a lot of the I'd take the color out, and it would be just mm -hmm. a very faint outline of that tank, and I yep. would draw it like that, and it saved me hours and hours of time. Yeah, so, I mean, anytime anything you can use. Um, for something like that, that's the way to do it. I mean, you find a way to cheat. I mean, well, you know, even with, um, I've even used, um, I would see a photograph of a building. I remember it here, let's see, where's that? If I can find that particular, there was a building in this town I went to and I took a picture of the, um, um, well, I didn't, tell you, I didn't take a picture of it. I found it in a book. This is the old, their old, um, uh, that's the old uh, um, Jewish uh, synagogue, mm -hmm. and it which no longer exists. But I will do that with buildings or, or anything like that, anything that saves you time. So I, yeah. I would like to more, but I'll tell you. I'll put you guys together and you can talk further yeah. on yeah. that. Yeah, we can, we can talk. He, yeah, I'd, I'd like to know more about because, I mean, uh, drawing, I, I did a, I've done several books about uh, aircraft, you know. In fact, I've been, it, it's been mentioned to me from the Naval Institute about doing something about, um, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, Patty Boynton, you know. Mm -hmm. And planes or something. They're a lot harder to draw, but if you had a 3D program like that, you could get that. I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to blow your mind, actually. You can go online and for free download hundreds of 3D models of airplanes. Oh, wow. And, and, and then just take a screenshot. If you, you don't even have to have a, you don't even have to have a 3D program. No. But you can go on to some of the, uh, and there must be at least a half dozen internet places where that can save all that stuff. That save you time. You put us together on that, Don. I will. Does anybody <laughs> else have any questions for Wayne? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is, and this is a dumb question. I'm sorry about that. But um, how do you keep your figures consistently looking the same and the same relative size and everything in every uh, panel? How come it doesn't you shift? You work hard at. <laughs> I, I do not. I do not have the great anatomy ability that a lot of the superheroes i, I mean I, I hate to draw superheroes because um I, I just because they're i just don't i'm just not that good at it um but i work hard at it um my character katusha is about five two and i really wanted to draw her to look like a little girl all the time uh also when i first started um working on this idea of the uh um of doing Katusha, I was trying to get her face right on the page. I, I am, I tell you, faces are so important. Um, I, I'm, it's like, I, I, I recognize actors, small actors. I said, well, she was in this or he was in that and all that, you know, kind of, I remember because I pay so much attention to faces. 
and I had a hard time getting it right. I knew what I wanted it to look like, but I couldn't get it right. And finally, I remember a lady I knew who lived in Panama City, Florida. And I called her. I said, you, how old is your daughter now? And she, she, she was from Odessa, from, from uh, Ukraine. And she said, she's 14. I says, okay, I'm going to come down next week and take pictures. So I used her for the basics of, uh, of Katusha. Um, I was trying to get that Slavic, um, uh, many of the Slav, Slavic people have uh, almost that, uh, um, what we call it, the mongoloid fold, fold their eyes, and, uh, and this girl did, I remember, and that's what, uh, and I remember I, sh I went to a book fair in Chicago several years ago, and I was showing this stuff to a lady who was, I was renting, uh, I got a little, um, Airbnb place in Chinatown, and this guy was a Chinese. Was Chinese, and she looked at it, and she says, "She looks Oriental." I said, "What? She's Slavic, you know." So, I succeeded, you know. And what was your other question? Just oh. as far as proportions, keeping a, a character the same size, you just know, be, as you draw it. it. Just be careful. Just, just pay attention to what you're doing. That's that's the thing. I think like math or something might be involved. Well, like a lot that. of artists go by heads, that a body oh, is yeah, like true, four or five true. heads high. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah, if, yeah that's, you got to keep that in mind, but it's not something you have to think about all the time. Um, um, let's see. Uh, I, remember, I remember years ago taking a class in, um, well, what do you call it? You have the, the distance. Was in oh, mind. perspective? Perspective, yeah, that's it. And uh, that's something to keep in mind. It, it, although it's not, you know, all that important because if you're in a town like an old part of Europe or something like that, there ain't no perspective left. So, <laughs> you know, you know, but you have to have it in mind a little bit just to, you know, to keep things right. That's a good question, Liz. Appreciate yeah. you asking that. Anybody else? All right, Wayne, this has been tremendous fun. Um, we're going to wrap up for just a second. If you'd like to hang with us for another minute, this is the part sure. of our meeting where people kind of share the good news that they might have. Does anyone have anything cool going on? Raise your hand. Oh, Maya. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I got a new um, freelance client. So awesome. That's always a good thing. <laughs> there you go. Keep it Is it like a regular gig or a one-time shot? Um, I would say at the shortest, it's probably like a like a long project, but it, it could turn into a a long time gig. Awesome! Good deal. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, it looks like I might be getting back into Encyclopedia Britannica after ten months. I haven't written for Britannica since uh, December, oh, okay. but I've got a meeting next month, uh, next week with the editor. And so fingers crossed, I'll be back writing that stuff. Well, I'm hoping that people are seeing that things are going coming back up, stuff like that. And we'll take it a while, but we're getting there. Uh, Drew. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I released volume two of thriving beyond the storm, which are stories about uh, how to make it through the pandemic for businesses oh. and individuals, and the uh, profits go to the Food Bank of Eastern and North Carolina. So I'm really glad that I was able to do release That's volume right. two. Do you think there'll be an additional volume or is two? Or oh, gonna... <laughs> I need to take a break. I did, <laughs> I did two right after one, and I got to go catch up with all my clients. So uh... yeah. <laughs> anyone else? All right. Well, I really appreciate you all coming this evening. I hope you enjoyed Wayne's uh, uh, talk about his graphic novels. Um, if you have would like some recommendations regarding titles, I'll throw some out via email um, tomorrow. Wayne, thank you very, very much sure. for joining us and, this and evening. This was thank you, Wayne. Give, give Joel my, uh, my uh, email address. I absolutely will put you guys Good. together so you Joel. can talk further on that.